If you wanna know how to control your emotions, cause what you're doing right now isn't working, this one's for you. We all have rage or anxiety that gets out of line, but at the wrong time, uncontrolled emotions can ruin your relationships, ruin your career, and lead to years of regret. To fix this, we're gonna go through three layers of strategies that fit together to help you control your emotions instead of them controlling you. And here's a bonus for you. Every method we're gonna discuss today needs no external resources. No money, no tools, no other people. So if it's just you, you can do it. I'm Dante, registered psychologist from Australia, and let's immediately begin. In the moments where your emotions are insanely out of control and your logical brain is suppressed and you're about to do something that you'll regret, you need to start with something simple that gives you a moment to pause, to lower the emotional intensity and to ride out the emotional wave until it comes back down to a manageable level. This is where layer one skills for distress tolerance come in. Basic things like gripping ice cubes, slow breathing, doing intense exercise or listening to loud music. These are all examples of perfectly fine things that you could do. They'll stop you from being completely caught up in your emotions and allow you to reconnect to the reality of the world. And they might seem simple, but there's a reason they work for some people and not for others. So I'll use an example to demonstrate how you can make sure that they actually work for you. Meet Road Rage Randy. Randy, surprisingly, has anger issues while driving. This makes his passengers really uncomfortable and leads to dangerous situations while driving that puts his life and his passengers' lives at risk. Even more surprisingly is that Randy's road rage has somehow not landed him in prison yet, and so he wants to learn how to control it before it's too late. Here's what wouldn't work. If Randy was just driving around and feeling a little bit murderous, trying to remember to, oh, I'll just take a deep breath, that wouldn't work. He wouldn't remember to do it, or he'd be too invested into his anger to be bothered with it. Here's what would work. Before Randy drives, he decides on which distress tolerance skill he's going to use. In Randy's case, he's decided on taking five slow deep breaths and then naming every single sound that he can hear. Then before he starts his car, he visualizes a situation that could occur in the future that would make his anger flare up, and he visualizes and practices running through this distress tolerance sequence. But that's not enough, because Randy has made a habit out of anger, and so breaking that habit is going to take time, work, and practice. And so Randy practices his distress tolerance plan multiple times every single day and every single time before he actually drives. This makes it so that when he's actually driving and something happens that makes his anger flare up, Randy has already primed his mind to know what to do. Randy needed to practice building a replacement habit to replace his anger habit. Now when it comes to your personal life, and it could be anger, anxiety, or sadness, or any other emotion, start by thinking about a distress tolerance skill that you could use, and practice using it many, many times so that when you actually need it, you're ready and practiced and primed to put it into work. So being able to tolerate emotions is a must have skill on the road to emotional control. But being able to tolerate distress while a necessary foundation is not the same as being able to control your emotions. Why are these emotions flaring up to begin with and how can you use them properly? You need to have answers and strategies to both of these questions if you wanna control your emotions instead of them controlling you. So to answer half of that question, how can we use emotions usefully? It's time to introduce you to a new person. Meet anxious Amanda. Amanda has a really important work presentation coming up and she is painfully underprepared for it. Because of this, she feels a lot of anxiety and this anxiety is constant. It's crippling her day-to-day -day mood, her ability to think, and the source of her anxiety is the upcoming presentation. So while she could just write out the anxiety anxious waves as they come, and this would help a little bit, the anxiety itself would just keep resurfacing because the source of the anxiety has not been resolved. And so Amanda's mental state and her job security itself would be screwed if distress tolerance was the only thing that she did. So in many cases, when emotions are intense and there's a clear source of the emotion, like in Amanda's life right now, it's better to do this. Step one, she would concentrate on her inner state and notice that the feeling that she's having is anxiety. Step two, she would then ask herself, what is my anxiety telling me? To which the answer would be, this presentation is going to go poorly and I'm going to embarrass myself in front of my peers and damage my reputation at work. Human emotions are just trying to communicate to us us a message telling us to do this thing, run away from that, solve this problem or do more of this pleasurable thing. Then at step three, it's time to turn her emotion into fuel and motivation. This would involve heeding the warning of the anxiety 
and pouring her energy into furiously preparing the best presentation she possibly can with the time that she has. The purpose of this is to make the anxiety feel helpful instead of crippling. Because when your emotions recognize that you're actually working hard to address the message they're telling you, then your emotions, rather than just being noisy and problematic, instead they become recruited into your motivational system and help fuel you to complete the task. So layer two solutions require you being able to tolerate emotions and then turning those emotions into fuel and motivation to improve your life. But there are four problems with the layer two approach of using emotions as motivational fuel. Number one, not all emotions have a clear identifiable source. Number two, not all sources of emotions can be easily addressed. For example, a natural disaster or a tantruming child. Number three, if you create a reliance on using negative emotions to push your life forward, then you can sometimes forget how to motivate yourself in other ways. And a long-term reliance on negative emotions can get really unhealthy. Now of course you can use positive emotions to fuel yourself as well and that's great. But I have a feeling if you're watching this video it probably isn't because you came here being like oh my god Dante I have an overwhelming amount of positive emotions and I'm just too positive and happy all the time. Help me control this. And the biggest problem with layer two strategies and the one that can actually get a little bit dangerous is this. Your emotions don't actually always want what's best for you. They think they do. Your emotions really do think that they want what's best for you, but emotions are often really short-sighted and occasionally they get very self-destructive. For example, if your social anxiety tells you to disengage from your friends because socializing is scary, then this leads to more social isolation and even worse social anxiety. So to summarize the problems with layer two strategies, it's that your emotions aren't always helpful or appropriate to the situation. So if they don't match up usefully, then you won't be able to usefully use your emotions as fuel. So in the times when your emotions don't match the situation appropriately, that's where we use layer three strategies. So here's the one, two, three of layer three. One, when emotions flare up, start with distress tolerance. Do what you need to do to bring your emotions down to a manageable level. They don't have to be a zero out of 10, but just manageable. Two, Analyze the message of the emotion. If it's a helpful message, then use it as fuel. If it's not, consider a skill called opposite action. This is where you do the literal opposite of what your emotions want. So if your social anxiety tells you to run away from friends, run towards them. If your anger wants you to accept an invitation into a fight, decline the invitation to fight and walk away. Three, your emotions and thoughts are always linked together. Unhelpful thoughts will lead to unhelpful emotions and unhelpful emotions will reinforce unhelpful thoughts. So identify the thoughts that are impacting and causing your emotions. And if those thoughts are unhelpful, generate new thoughts that would create appropriate emotions. And then once you're having an appropriate emotional response, then use layer two strategies of using your emotions as fuel to better your life. For example, with Road Rage Randy, his anger while driving is not helpful to his life. It's dangerous and it makes his passengers think that he's one roundabout away from being charged with vehicular manslaughter. So since there's no real useful application for his anger in these moments, he can't really use his anger as useful fuel, so he needs to try to examine the anger response itself and change that. When someone cuts him off in traffic, Randy has thoughts that people are disrespecting him. This thought then leads to his anger and this anger leads to the big blowups. Instead of treating these thoughts and the subsequent blowups as inevitable, Randy can anticipate these thoughts of perceived disrespect. And then he can counter them by thinking more logical and helpful thoughts such as, they probably aren't disrespecting me. Everyone just sometimes has a bad day of driving. This new thought won't create such an out of control rage and thus Randy will now have better control over the situation. But there's a deeper layer to all of this and it involves beliefs and memories. Like with Road Rage Randy, why is he perceiving such intense disrespect just from a traffic incident? And with Anxious Amanda, why is she getting so incredibly anxious about the upcoming presentation? Everyone has to do presentations throughout their life at some point and everyone gets a little bit anxious and nervous, that's normal. But Amanda's anxiety is incredibly out of proportional and incredibly intense. What are the core beliefs and what are the memories memories that are making her feel this out of proportion emotionality. Randy and Amanda would probably benefit from one-on-one -on -one therapy targeting their beliefs and assumptions, but that's an enormous topic which deserves a video of its own, so it's going to get one in the future. But back to Randy and layer three strategies. I know that putting these strategies to work in the moment is incredibly hard to do. To actually pull it off to use these strategies when big emotions start to flare up, 
Here's what I recommend. Utilize visual rehearsal in anticipation of events where you expect unhelpful thoughts and emotions to arise and practice it many, many times. This way when unhelpful wild emotions start to spring up, you're gonna be prepared for them and ready to use your distress tolerance skills. And then once the distress tolerance skills have brought the emotions down to a manageable workable level, then you can use your pre-practiced thought changes to create new, more adaptive, more helpful emotional responses. And if you're really struggling to do this Solo, that's completely understandable. So consider getting a guide to help you through the process because they can help you to climb the mountain a lot faster. Free bonus tip for you. While building up distress tolerance skills is good and increasing your emotional regulation is good, you also want to reduce your predisposition to being overwhelmed by emotions in the first place. And you can do this by reducing your level of day-to-day -day chronic stress. So fixing diet, sleep, improving your social connection and cutting down on substance use is going to go a long way. And in particular, there's really good scientific evidence that shows that intense daily exercise is better than medication for sleep, anxiety, and mood regulation. With all of these changes in place, the life that you can hope to lead is one where when your emotions come up, they're appropriate to the context and you can tolerate their intensity. And then you can either use them as fuel when needed, or if there is something that's a bit inappropriate with them or unhelpful with them, you can use these layer three strategies to change the emotional response itself. To maintain this new life, regular practice of these techniques might be needed for some time. You ideally want these strategies and this way of approaching emotions to become a habit to become natural and to replace your old habits. If you want to know more about any of the techniques in particular that I talked about, or if you're struggling to implement them, or if you have any questions in general, you know where to leave them. Appreciate you sticking it out to the end of the video. Bye.